news is a very sacred department. News really controls society's perceptions. There's a consistent effort to discredit journalists. The majority of people who use social media, digital literacy is not there. What social media companies are basically buying and selling is your attention span. The cyberbullying that's happening because of this fake news. The real danger of that kind of disinformation, that divisive disinformation, is that it could result in violence. I still think that truth-telling is alive and well. Welcome to The Big Debate. I'm Ridi Klaibn. Did the government steal 41 gazillion dollars from a fund managed by Tokyo Sekwale? Did a mother in Tembisa give birth to 10 babies? The so-called decouplets, I can't even pronounce the word, setting a new world record. Do vaccines contain microchips so that Bill Gates can track us via 5G? No, 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 because these stories are fake. But millions of us find ourselves unsure, at least for a moment, what to believe. Now, why is that? Could it be because so many people, including friends, share false ideas on social media? Is it that some of the stories were published prominently by our trusted news sources? Or does it result from people joining together facts with fiction into a toxic brew? A brew that's easy to swallow if it helps to reinforce our worldview. But the fallout from fake news is not a laughing matter. Careers are destroyed innocent people discredited, vital institutions like SARS decimated. In the worst case scenario, people die because they believed lies about life-saving medicines like ARVs and COVID-19 vaccines. Have we entered a post-truth world where it's impossible to distinguish fact from fiction? Or can we neutralize fake news? Well, joining me today are Michael Makovitz, head of Gibbs Media Leadership Think Tank, newly launched, congratulations, and non-executive board member of the SABC. Pumzile Van Dam, former DAMP, a firebrand, I'd say, and now a specialist on disinformation. We have Kate Wilkinson, deputy chief editor at Africa Check, and of course, a pleasure to also be joined by Ndibaleng Murake, community activist with the Social Justice Coalition. Thank you guys for joining us. I'm also joined by Jean Leroux, Research Associate for the Sub-Saharan Africa region at the Atlantic Council. Plus, of course, our virtual big debate audience from all over South Africa. Welcome to all of you. And of course, you at home, we value your time. Thank you for joining us. Remember that you can be a part of this conversation by using the hashtag on your screen. Michael, let me start with you. I know you're not representing the SABC, but this is true of all media in South Africa. Are we not part of the problem when it comes to fake news and misinformation, where what constitutes newsworthiness depends on who is in management, depends on who sits on the board, even in some cases, like the SABC, I dare say, depends on who is at Lutwili House? I wouldn't exactly agree with you that it's exactly the same thing. I think when one looks at the prevalence of the global social media networks, which are unregulated, one needs to differentiate them from the, the print media and the broadcast media, which are self-regulated. There's the BCCSA, there's the uh, press code, and also during elections, broadcasters are very heavily regulated through ICASA. So I think what we're looking at here is how are we dealing with the spread of misinformation and disinformation across networks which are completely unregulated and they've got the prevalence to spread it at an exponential rate. That doesn't mean to say the, the other broadcasters and, and print media don't have a role to play. We often may repeat fake information that comes from other media. So I think we've all got to watch ourselves, but we're dealing with two different spheres. One is regulated, others not regulated. Pumze, let me bring you in here. I hear what Michael is saying, but here's my problem. I see myself as a journalist, as part of mainstream media. And I think in some instances, we do make the audience stupid. We give them the lowest hanging fruit. We don't question what comes at us. We repeat what newsmakers are saying without verifying it. And then it's almost kind of arrogant to abdicate our responsibility and say, we're not guilty of fake news. They are. We're telling you the truth. But is it the truth? I think we... we need to um, distinguish the terminology. I think fake news as a terminology refers specifically to the media. There is what has now become the media specifically finding the news on social media, and that increases the risk of fake news. I do think that 
responsibility is often focused on just the platforms as Michael spoke about, but I think there is an additional responsibility that is placed on news organization that is placed on individuals themselves. The South African media in particular don't focus on disinformation as a subject. I understand that the media space is very packed with stories of corruption, but I think there is a responsibility in terms of educating the public about disinformation and fake news. So I'd say in terms of that responsibility, um, the media is not playing in an, a big enough role and the focus is only placed on, you know, the platforms are being regulated. So Kate, Michael says social media, the unregulated spaces, but Pumzile says even mainstream media, everybody's passing the buck. I mean, who's responsible for where we find ourselves? Well, I think what we've really hit on here is that we're facing a, a multifaceted problem. The reality is that information and bad information is spreading um, largely unchecked on many, if not most, social media platforms. The media, I would argue, um, often gets caught in reporting disinformation or misinformation due to a number of different factors, one being a 24-hour news cycle, the other being a lack of training and emphasis on fact-checking. But then another problem we face is that we have societies and communities that have not been equipped with the necessary media literacy skills and don't actually have the tools, the understanding to interrogate what is an avalanche of information that we have to deal with every day. Mm -hmm. So we've got our work cut out for us and we need to find different sectors of society to tackle different parts of this problem so that we can holistically try and solve it. Dibaleng, how are communities affected by misinformation, disinformation, fake news even? I think one of the things that we've seen as a result um, of fake news and just uh, misinformation is that it also translates um, to um, incidences of vigilantism. Over the past five years, when you look at the crime stats, vigilantism has sort of um, grown in various working class communities across the country. And part of that is obviously feeling that there's been a breakdown of relations between themselves and the police. But I think another part of it is that um, of misinformation and fake news that are feeding into a certain narrative. Um, and as a result of the narrative around the criminal justice system and then people feeling that the police are inadequate, then people end up taking then the law into their own hands. But the reality is that, you know, people are really impacted um, on the ground by it. Michael, I mean, is the media doing enough then to counter this? I do think we could do a lot more. The problem that, that we have, there's no magic bullet. You know, in certain countries, we have what we call digital dictators who just flick a switch and switch off the internet. That is, That cannot happen in South Africa. It would be unconstitutional. So we've got to find much more sophisticated ways to combat these incidences of disinformation and misinformation. And it does require... For media literacies, it does require a reporting um, um, of fake news to various sources and a range of other issues. But we also need to look at the sustainability of the media. If you're saying that the media must report and isolate and focus on fake news, we need a strong media. And I think we've got a situation at the moment where the sustainability of the media, generally speaking, is not a guaranteed situation. I want to come to Jean in just a moment to talk about that elephant in the room, algorithms. But Pumzile, I do find myself questioning myself, thinking by my mere presence on social media, and by the way, I love Twitter. I absolutely love Twitter and I'm not getting off. Does my mere presence on social media mean that I'm also complicit in a way? Am I not at risk of spreading unverified information because it comes from people who perhaps reinforce my worldview, people that I respect and so on. Are we not complicit? I think we should just all accept disinformation is here with us to stay. We're in the digital age. And I think an important aspect of it is changing the way that users interact with information online. And part of that is behavioral change. So it's, it's accepting that there's complicit bias. So for your for yourself, like you know you have a specific worldview mm. and that what you post is influenced by that worldview. You also know that, okay, I need to stop and I need to check. Um, and I need to make sure that what I share is, you know, is correct. So I think that type of behavioral change needs to be instilled in everyone. It's something that needs to be taught from a very young age. So that's part of the projects that we're currently rolling out for the election. 
John, let me bring you in here. What does it mean then if the information to which we are exposed simply reinforces our worldview and we think we are in control, but Twitter, Facebook, and other social media platforms are managing us somehow using the algorithm. Tell us about that. What social media companies are basically buying and selling is your attention span. They try to keep you on their platforms for as long as possible. And they do that by showing you content that you agree with, uh, views that you're aligned with, because that keeps you on the, on the platform. If you log into Twitter and you see somebody you don't agree with, you're going to spend less time on that. And that means basically less advertising time for those platforms. So they've got an incentive to create these echo chambers to get people with the same views aligned. And that's actually something that can be exploited quite easily by bad actors. You can set up bot networks. You can set up um, scores of sock puppet accounts, which pretend to be South Africans, for example. Okay, okay, Jean, j just talk to me like I'm four years old. What is a bot? To classify them, bots would be an automated account that acts on a certain set of parameters. So say, for example, you can create a bot that would at 12 noon every single day, just send out one specific tweet. And that's programmed, that, that's automatic. Similarly, you can program that bot to amplify a specific hashtag, a specific phrase, a specific user. And that generates this idea that there's support or amplification of a topic. It's very useful to then trick the social media algorithms themselves to put specific hashtags or specific topics onto trending lists. And this then gets traditional or regular users to kind of see that, buy into that, and then engage with it organically. So how does fake news lead to hatred and death? We ask this when we return. This is The Big Debate. Welcome back. You're watching The Big Debate. Today, we are trying to understand fake news, its impact on our society, and the way we view each other. An often repeated narrative is that foreign nationals are a threat to South Africans' interests. Let's take a look at this. Foreigners come here for the opportunity and are willing to work harder. So that's why they're taking jobs, because South Africans are not willing to put in the work. Wow. That's, wow. I don't think foreigners are taking jobs from South Africans. And you know what's saddening is that we refuse to address the real problem. Mm -hmm. The real problem is the system that's in place. People should be addressing home affairs. They should be addressing the ministry, the business of ministry department, not the foreigners. As a foreigner, it's really sad. Yeah, in the hospitality sector, definitely. Otherwise, not really, because most of them, they come with their own initiative. Yeah, they are selling all kinds of artwork. Some are doing drugs, selling drugs, but at the end of the day, it was never a job. It was an initiative. Anybody can come up with an initiative. Hela la South Africa na tisi ne lungelo ende si baningi gogo etu. Mara inde zagali Africa gobo ning gobo ning babo. Xenophobia, I think, is hugely fueled, if not 100%, like by by the media. I think. When people get like attacky, I, I don't. I don't think everyone like. I don't think South Africans are angry and racist for foreigners. I think a lot of South Africans are just scared, and like the media tends to feed that. Kate, I mean, let, let's just talk about this, right? Foreigners are here to steal our jobs. They're responsible for most of the crime. Fact or fiction? We have a wide spectrum of claims about migrants and the role and impact that they're having on our societies. And a lot of these fears and misconceptions are rooted in communities, but they're also fueled and fed by very powerful political players in our country. We have had Herman Mashaba making completely incorrect and unsubstantiated claims about 80% of the inner city in Johannesburg being foreigners. Not true. We have had the president of the African Transformation Movement making similar claims about 70% of our informal sector being dominated by migrants. Not true. The data on this is pretty limited, but what we do know is that foreign-born migrants are more likely to be unemployed than South Africans, but they're also more likely to be employed in precarious work and the informal sector. And importantly, um, studies done by the University of the Witwatersrand's African Center for Migration and Society show that between 2012 and 2017, the unemployment rate increased for both migrants and for South Africans. Pumzile, I want to bring you in here. Some of the people who've made these inflammatory statements 
were your former comrades when you were a politician. And it's not just in the DA. In other parties as well, we've heard these kinds of misrepresentations. We've heard campaigns like put South Africa first. It implies that other people are responsible for our problem. Is it difficult to respond to this as a politician when your comrades are responsible for this? It is the kind of campaigning that seeks to divide South Africa. It's easy to spread hate given our, our history. You know, there's parties that campaign on demonizing different race groups. There's parties like, you know, Omen Mashaba's party, Action SA, that campaign on, you know, demonizing foreign nationals. Yeah. So the real danger of that kind of disinformation, that divisive disinformation, is not just that voters are manipulated, is that it could result in violence. Let, let's say um, from Dibaleng, because Dibaleng, you are in those communities, right? These kind of WhatsApps or information, it spreads. Tell us how it plays out. Politicians and the media often manipulate the fact that people are structurally um, oppressed, right? Um, and that there's a structural violence in South Africa that there's chronic unemployment, um, there's massive inequality, and therefore then use all those um, cracks, I guess, in the system to try and mobilize people into a certain kind of action that isn't actually even in their favor. Sure. Um, and then the reality then is that when the violence happens, it's not happening in parliament. The violence is not going to happen in, in Sabavia. The violence is actually happening in townships. It's not going to affect the person that is a key stakeholder in saying, put South Africa think... first or saying black first, land first. It's not affecting those people. It's affecting the people on the ground in the community. It's really unfortunate that people's vulnerabilities are weaponized in this way. Michael, I'm going to come to you in just a moment, but I first want to bring in Ramzi Abdallah from the Somali community organization whose community often bears the brunt of xenophobic fake news. Thanks for having me uh, into this discussion. Uh, first of all, People, they always say the foreign nationals, they take the jobs of the South Africans, former uh, mayor uh, of Johannesburg, uh, Herman Mashaba, he was saying like 15 million uh, foreign nationals are living in South Africa, which, uh, which is untrue. Uh, he also mentioned 80% of uh, the Johannesburg residents are foreign nationals, which is also uh, not true. There's only 3.9 million foreign born in South Africa. Let me come to the other point saying foreign nationals are not taking the jobs of the local citizens. And 90% of the foreign nationals, they are self-employed. You won't find any company that's hiring foreign nationals before the South Africans. When I want to go to apply a job, the first thing that I will be asking is, are you a South African citizen? Then the South African citizen always gets the first opportunity. The jobs that the, the foreign nationals are doing, it's a self-employed job. Right. Everyone can be self-employed. I mean, Michael, are we then, as mainstream media, fueling this divisive uh, 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 talk and the perceptions because we report what the newsmaker is saying and leave it at that? From a journalistic point of view, what should we be doing? I think really we, we, we need to take more responsibility because basically, you know, we're bound by the Constitution. The media is an integral part of sustaining the Constitution. And therefore, one would think that anything that conflicts with our fundamental constitutional values, which is based on human rights and which xenophobia is an antithesis of, it would need to be countered. You know, one wouldn't want a situation where we say we just report uncritically. But I do think we also need to get some accountability from the social media platforms. We've got 25 million South Africans who are now active on social media. There's only four radio stations in the country that have more than 3 million people. So we're dealing with already a substantial portion of the population. I take your point. Absolutely, we need to contextualize. We cannot just report as is and leave it unsaid. But I also think from the social media platforms, we need an early warning system, really, because... Mm -hmm. We saw what happened in July where there seemed to be a very, very sluggish response yes. time uh, from the platforms. And I think that we've got to do a lot better on. Kate, very quickly before we go on a break, I mean, in a story like that, how do you report on this accurately? 
I think that there are different ways to approach it depending on your the format of the media that you're working on. If you're working in print, you often might have a bit more time to fact check, to do a Google search, speak to an expert. But if I could speak to every or any journalist in the country, if you are interviewing someone on radio or television for print and they make a claim that is significant, whether it be how many migrants there are in the country or the state of the economy, all you have to do is say, where is that information from? And if they tell you, you can write that in your story. So-and-so attributed the statistic to X. But if they can't tell you quickly and clearly and confidently, you need to convey that to your reader so that you or listener or viewer so that you can give them a sense of whether this is information they can trust. And then depending on the time you have, follow up with a fact checking story, speak to Africa Check to get us to investigate it. And we'll gladly come and debunk false and incorrect claims that are having negative impacts on our country. There are so many politicians who talked about a vaccine or a cure for COVID coming from Cuba and they were just quoted without any, any reminder that there was no cure for COVID and there was no vaccine, certainly, at that time. Now, can we still trust radio, TV and newspapers as the place we go to for the truth? When we return, we make sense of all the camps. Still trying to figure out who's Tumamina and who's R.E.T. Me too, by the way. Don't go away. Ten triple one. Over done about ten. Ten, I wouldn't say three at best. In the day, I can yes. Come on. Welcome back to the big debate. Do people still trust the media? We asked some of you, and here's what you had to say. I do trust in news. In taking it, but I'm very good. Some people are going to so so. In the name, can be so so. Yeah, bro. Yeah. Well, I don't really trust them, but to an extent, they are producing news, you know. There are some very good journalists, very good, very uh, trustable people out there. Uh, but don't, don't say I trust everybody. I'm grateful for the information they share with me, but I don't always trust that it's real. Even though there are fabrications and they are not that much facts given to us, but yeah, we still do trust you guys. Oh, that's nice to know. Let's do an audience poll. I mean, who here thinks you can divide the media into two camps? In case you didn't know, the Tumamina uh, camp, a group broadly supporting President Cyril Ramaphosa with everything that it entails, his efforts to clean up the government, his uh, global investment drive, anti-corruption, uh, so-called anti-corruption uh, new dawn. And then there is, of course, the second camp. That's the RET, or Radical Economic Transformation, a grouping that may support other ANC factions or more populist parties asserting that race is at the root cause of everything in South Africa. So let's see you wave if you feel the media is in these two camps. Do you think there are camps in the media? Wave? You... No? Yes? There are camps in the media? Okay. Michael, let me bring you in here. The audience, some members of the audience believe that there are camps in the media. You are a board member of the SABC. I mean, which camp is the SABC in? Do these dichotomies influence the way we report? Nice, really. That's, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> um, seriously, no, I, I don't think so. I think the SABC has got probably the most sophisticated, independent, comprehensive editorial policies that it's ever had in its history. There's Policy versus implementation? Plan. I don't think the SABC is in, a, is in any so-called camp. I think there might be journalists who have certain preferences, it's different points of view, but to say a media organization as a whole is in a particular camp. And I also do think uh, some of the camps are kind of very binary, very media created, they're simplistic and maybe don't tell the whole story. I certainly feel that uh, the SABC is subject to quite uh, a lot of uh, self-regulation and people can complain on any level. Maybe right now we can talk about this. I mean, uh, Shaudi Mutsweneng was the boss of the SABC. He certainly was and still is in a particular camp. And of course, this also predates Shaudi. We can talk about uh, the Mbegi AIDS denialism at that time. I was working at the SABC at that time and I was given an instruction not to ask the president about HIV and AIDS there. I said it, it happened, it really did. The point is the powers that be do want to capture a public broadcaster. In reality, do we see the impartial 
uh, uh, reportage that you are loading today? Really, what I will say is the fact that politicians or anyone else may try and influence or pressure, that's always going to happen. Yeah. It's not a question of whether there is pressure. It's a question of what do you do about it. And I can absolutely sure that certainly from the board side, there's been zero interference in editorial independence. I can absolutely assure you of that. And to the extent that we know we've got an editor-in-chief who is totally independent. So I firmly believe the SABC has moved from those state broadcaster years to trying to be a fully-fledged independent public broadcaster. I mean, Pumzile, let me bring you in here. It's all very well to pick on the SABC because it is our public broadcaster. But let's be honest, media ownership is a controversial issue. You have IOL being owned by Iqbal Survey. It's got a particular style. Uh, you have this platform on which I am being owned by other shareholders and so on. Is ownership an issue? Look, I actually have quite a positive view of the media in South Africa. And I think the SABC is the, it's the best that it's been in a very long time. I think the this information plays a very important role in how the media has been portrayed. And I think people don't really trust the media anymore. And that's part of the manner in which the creators of disinformation like it. What has happened is that the trust has pivoted away from the media and the camps, if you had to look at the camps, the camps are now more divided into the different individuals on social media. And the media is no longer the source of information because it's been discredited. Disinformation has played a very important role in the media no, no longer being trusted. Um, and I think this is a global thing. Like Donald, Donald Trump, it's fake news, fake yeah, news. Yeah, even when it's true. Media in fact, Jean, I, I want to hear your views on this one because it, it seems to be a specific strategy. Malign everybody in the media, call everything and everyone fake news so that there is a lack of focus on your own actions. Let's just speak to a community journalist, uh, Jonathan Griffiths. Uh, you've got thoughts on, uh, on fake news, misinformation and mainstream media. Please share them. I strongly believe as a journalist myself that once you're involved in the media industry, your, your strongest component needs to be neutrality. I'm sure many community media broadcasters have been a victim of fake news or have been exposed to fake news. And this is because um, news over the years, according to studies, has become more uh, subjective, more than objective. So that now messes around with the authenticity of the news content. And also another thing, um, especially for community media, we rely on advertisers because they pay the bills. So advertisers really put pressure on us as, as journalists to avoid portraying any sort of bad media coverage. But above all, news is a very sacred department. News really controls society's perceptions. If you are a community media broadcaster, or if you are in the media industry and you feel like you do not have all the editorial policies in place, or you're not so well versed about journalism, I suggest you abstain from that because it is better to rather produce no news rather than producing. Okay, we got we got news. you. We know we've got other senior journalists uh, in the audience today, Gia Nicolaides, we have Andy Swa as well. I wonder how you experience this, uh, uh, Gia. Well, really, I, I think that there are a number of challenges that the, the media actually faces, but it comes down to a couple of important back to basics. We are often rushed to get that story out, but we need to slow down, verify the facts. And it doesn't matter in this day and age anymore if you are first or if you are second in terms of getting that news. It's about if you're right. And the other thing is about being transparent, being transparent with your viewers, your audience, your listeners. Because if you are basing an entire story on a tweet, or several tweets that have gone viral over a day or two, but you haven't done enough information or research about it, but it's still the hot topic in South Africa. Yes, you can talk about it, but you need to tell your audience exactly what the process is that you're following. Yes, we're looking at this particular story. At the moment, we're only speaking to these people. We haven't been able to get hold of that person. It's about being transparent. That being said, I still think that truth-telling is alive and well. Think about some of the major stories in South Africa. Mandy Rousseau uncovering in Kandla the upgrades to the former president's home. The Vata Klua airport base when the Guptas landed there. Marikana, for instance. The reason why you saw some of that footage was because the media was there. The police yeah. was recording it too, but their footage disappeared. So okay. there's so much um, that the media still can do and still is doing. But it's about looking at 
ethical and insightful journalism, not just reporting the up and down basics of the facts, but right. contextualizing information and putting it out there to the public to make them understand how you came about this particular piece of information. Thanks, Gia. And Andy Swa, what do you think, my friend? What do you think? There's a worrying um, trend um, that's coming through where um, there's a consistent effort to discredit journalists um, and the media. Um, I find myself um, worried because we were also part of the Tumamina group, um, a story that was peddled where we received so many calls, so many threats that we were part of um, the, the, the Tumamina group to portray or push a narrative that would be more favorable to the president. And so I think Okay, we'll see, we'll see if we can reconnect with Andy. But can I bring in Jean at this point of the conversation? I have seen it in action, the deliberate attempt to create this paralysis, to malign everybody, so that the audience is left feeling everybody is lying, to make the truth and lies indistinguishable from each other. That's a specific uh, strategy, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's kind of two parts to that. The one is it's something called the liar's dividend, where if you can cast enough doubt, it allows you to portray even the truth as being fake news. One of my colleagues did an investigation on this being used in India, for example, where politicians were using the allegations of fake news as a kind of a shield to hide behind. Even though the allegations were true, they called it fake news and it was perceived as fake news at the end of the day. Um, the second part of this is that the media is generally trusted. The media is generally seen as portraying truth. It, even though they get it wrong, there's still a measure of accountability by journalists in the form of the press council and so forth. But what a lot of the disinformation actors do is they actually try and actively undermine trust in the media. Uh, the moment they do that, they create this void where they can then step into as the truth speakers. Uh, this presents an entirely alternative set of facts, an alternative reality almost, where they are the ones giving you the real truth that the mainstream media is trying to hide from you. Andy Swa, we really want to hear your thoughts. As the media industry, we need to guard against any opportunity for people who want to destabilize the country, destabilize our democracy, to, to find ways to discredit us. Because there's something that is also that we need to also be aware of, which is confirmation bias. In the incident of the Tuma Mina WhatsApp group um, story where um, screenshots from the group circulated, my name was right there at the top. It was difficult to change the narrative, even when we showed the public on social media that this is a very innocent group that just discusses media releases, advisories. But because of the confirmation bias, people didn't buy the story. They saw that us clarifying that this was just an innocent group as actually um, us hiding the nefarious activities that we're doing. What I also want to appeal to fellow colleagues in, in the media is that when we cover stories, we need to make sure that our stories are watertight, that there wouldn't be a, a scenario where we have to now go and apologize uh, for a story that we printed on the front page uh, because then that adds to the narrative that media cannot be trusted. Mm. And with the media that is not trusted, it has a dire impact on our democracy. Also, we need to capacitate research. I find that media across the country, we are not investing in research. So when you have people like Tokyo Sekhwale saying that 41 billion was stolen. Gazillion, get your facts we right, it was gazillion. What the, Gazillions, yes. We need to understand the mechanics of how the Reserve Bank operates before we can run with such a, such a story. The, even the, the story of the 10 babies. Yeah, let, 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 let's talk about it. So the entire country was wondering if these babies were really born in South Africa. And it seems that months later, there are still some people who are unsure. We asked people how many babies they think were born. Let's see. In the day, But in social media and the nama, nama publishers, they keep on feeding us new information. Leo, but with no, with no concrete proof, you are very unsagali. Level. That's why I mean, I'm following you. Ten triple one. I'm ten triple one. Ten visa. I'm visiting ten triple one. 
Even now, as Gavoni, Yana, and I'm a peaks here, and I'm a Vantuana. I'd say perhaps three. <laughs> three at best. I can't, ten, I wouldn't say. Three at best. <laughs> yeah, I remember that story. Um, when I see on Facebook when they post the pictures of the baby, there was only nine. Of which I don't believe that a normal person can give birth nine babies. Yeah, 10 babies, ne? And easy. Ah, easy. When we come back, we hear your views on fake news and how to deal with it. Don't go away. Welcome back to the big debate on fake news. When Dudu Zuma posts a video of hands cocking an AK-47 rifle and shooting bullets into the night sky to encourage people to join in, do you check if it's real first before forwarding it? When you read a tweet or a newspaper article criticizing your favorite politician, do you dismiss it as being more Tumamina or RET propaganda? What's your view on our fake news problem? I really, really want to engage with our audience today. Kamagu, I see you've raised your hand and you've got thoughts on this one. Um, the reason why, uh, or the reason behind uh, fake news is that uh, people want to trend. Uh, people... Uh, want uh, to get the clicks, they want to get the reach. In some cases, if it's a website, it uh, uh, does that so that they get more traffic to the website uh, and so that they are able to get more advertisers. So uh, it's, it's, it's linked to monetary value. That's my understanding behind the topic. Thanks very much, Tamaku. Nomshado, what are your thoughts on this topic? We've been focusing on the what and almost leaving the elements of the why and the how and empowering citizens to be able to actually distinguish what are we saying when we're saying disinformation and, and misinformation. And the term itself, fake news, why are we still using that when we clearly know that there are people who are driving false narratives, there are people who are obviously going behind this with a certain agenda, and we need to empower citizens to be able to distinguish this and most importantly know how to counteract it. And that's why at MMA we've been developing, you know, different certain platforms to be able to give citizens the power to say that if you are unsure of something or if you see something, you can do one, two, three, four, five. Journalists can't do this themselves. You know, Ukumzila can't do this herself. We need to come together and counteract this as a whole nation. Mm, thank you so, so very much, Nomshado. Thanks indeed. I'll be speaking from a master's student, psychology master's student's perspective. The people who are receiving this fake news, what psychological impact it has on them. For example, when COVID was introduced in South Africa, people go do panic buy, uh, buying. So we see a lot of people having anxiety, stress, depression, and the negative impact it has on people's emotions and the cyber bullying that's happening because of this fake news. So it is very important that uh, not only the journalists, but the influencers and the celebrities, before they go out on social media and uh, share whatever information that they got, they may see what, um, that this information, it is credible because it has a harmful impact on the people on the grassroots level. We should be very, very careful on what we share with the people. Thank you. I really appreciate what you're saying because this is not fun and games, you know. There are real consequences to that and the mental health element uh, is very important for you to remind us of. I'd actually just like to come back to something that Nomshado said that we actually need a society-wide approach to combat this problem. The media is blaming social media, which is basically like blaming the public, and people view social media as fact when actually it's opinion. So we kind of all need to come together to establish a way forward so that we can tell fact from fiction and honesty is integral to this. Um, we can't put ourselves into camps because it's not this or that. There's actually a place called and, and that's where we find ourselves. Thank you. I, I, I believe that the inexperience uh, of some of the reporters that we have in the media houses who then get bullied by the media houses to come in and report uh, as quickly as they can uh, leads to uh, reporting of fake news, uh, unverified news. The journalists, because of the inexperiences, uh, tend to then um, forget the the the, uh, the 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 principles of journalism 101. Any information that you put out there, people need to understand that it has the ability to influence people 
either to do good or to do bad. You cannot have, for instance, a story like the 10 baby story, which is, uh, you know, was published by a well-known journalist. It cannot be acceptable from, from somebody who's a professional. Social media, I think that majority of people who use social media are not informed. Uh, you can say that digital literacy is not there, but somebody who is a journalist, a trained journalist, I cannot accept that from them. In the social media space, I mean, we've been dealing with problems uh, for a long time. There were faked Auditor General reports circulated about Patricia Lil two years ago. Last week, a uh, heavily edited video to suggest that um, the former uh, Springbok coach, Peter de Villiers, thought she was corrupt. That's a very difficult thing to, to combat. So maybe your panelists have got some ideas for us on how, as we lead up to the elections and that sort of stuff becomes more prominent, um, what the public can do to, to do their independent fact-checking. I just want to say that um, this fake news concept has really uh, made um, social media pe personalities lie to us because if they are accused of a crime, then they go to social media and claim that it's fake news when it's not fake news, it's the truth. And then they further victimize the victim. So it's also messing up the justice system because now everybody will be siding with the social media personality instead of this unknown person who has um, laid charges or who has made claims or accusations. Mm. So now you will find that some people, they just drop out of the face of the earth and they, they go into their small little corners and they, they drop the charges because it's already hard to come out, to come out and, and say what you were victimized of. Now, now you're being accused of spreading um, fake news on top of that, that whatever happened to you is false. I've often observed how uh, even in, in, in court cases, judicial processes, people would refuse to participate in those, but then go and argue their cases on social media. But Jean, on social media, should we have more regulation and how? I personally am not particularly keen on more regulation. In Africa in particular, there's been a history of authoritarian governments using those kind of regulations to clamp down on free speech and on the free media even. We've seen just this year on several occasions where governments have shut down internet access to the entire country uh, during the times of elections or upheavals or times of unrest. So I'm personally against that, but at the same time, it, there, there is a reason for social media companies to take more responsibility for these kind of actions. There is lots of examples from Myanmar, for example, where Facebook was used to um, almost incite a genocide uh, among Zarinias. Locally, it's been an uphill battle getting uh, Twitter, for example, to provide information on individuals who are involved in current litigation with the South African Human Rights Commission. There needs to be more you know, accountability from the platforms themselves in the jurisdictions in which they operate and eventually, at the end of the day, make money. Then is it true that fake news spreads six times faster than fact? Whose responsibility is it to ensure our public discourse is rooted in the truth? Share your thoughts with us on social media and we'll hear our panel's answer when we return. Stay with us. So welcome back to the big debate. How do we tackle fake news and its devastating impact on our communities? We're hearing last comment from our panelists. Ndibeleng, I'm going to start with you. I think it's really important, I think, moving forward um, to really understand that the narrative that, you know, we put out there, be it on social media or the media, can be harmful to people. And to also be aware of how disseminating information in itself can be a way of perpetuating um, various stereotypes, um, various myths that we have. So we just need to make sure that, um, yeah, we don't further perpetuate um, divisiveness and, and, and various other harmful things. Um, for ourselves and for other people. Kate, your thoughts? The best piece of advice I can give to anyone in South Africa right now as we approach an election is if you see something dodgy, do something. If you're in a WhatsApp group and an auntie shares something that you suspect is false and you have information that debunks it, share it. If you're on a social media platform and you suspect that something is false information, report it. And if you don't know where to find the facts or how to sort fact from fiction, there are lots of organizations such as Africa Check who you can WhatsApp, email, tweet, or Facebook message with what you want fact checked. And we will help you figure out what is true and what is false and hold people accountable when they spread false information. 
Sure, Pumzile, you've got a lot of work ahead of you as we approach the election. Final thoughts from you. So our dis anti-disinformation project is not only kind of monitoring and combating disinformation, there's a big aspect of it focusing on advocacy, and it's also focusing on psychology and behavioral change and how we focus on changing the relationship of South African internet users and the, uh, and the internet. And the last message I could uh, give to um, the media, since this is a subject of fake news, I would request that media houses invest in uh, forensic digital investigation. So the skills that Jean have, some focus needs to be placed on uh, uncovering disinformation stories and the pub public becomes uh, more aware of that kind of work. I think we did great work with Bell Pottinger and I think there are many more stories out there that just need to be uncovered. Thank you, Pumzila. Michael? I align with everything that my panel colleagues have said, but I just want to make it clear. I don't support state regulation of, of social media or any of the media for the matter. We all are self-regulated. But if social media companies who are, let's not forget, making billions of dollars from, from our data across continents, if they want to avoid more regulation, I suggest they become more accountable, more responsive, more transparent, particularly, really, when it comes to do with misinformation on health, misinformation on xenophobia, and particularly now on elections. I think we need a lot more responsiveness from them on those issues, for sure. Thank you so very much uh, to my panel and my audience members as well. Fake news and disinformation have existed for as long as humans have communicated. That is a fact. The National Party forced millions into homelands with its fake news that separate development was helping everyone. Trump rallied his MAGA supporters by telling untruths about a stolen election. How do we ensure that facts prevail in a time when the net is easily used to spread falsehoods. Whose responsibility is it to ensure that the truth actually prevails? Is it the media? Is it stronger regulation of free speech on social media? Or is it our responsibility as audience, meaning you, your responsibility, to question what appears on your screen based on facts, not politics? You decide. Thank you so much for watching The Big Debate. I'm Ridi Khabi. Goodbye.